Recently, I had the opportunity to fish with my really good buddies, the Abels. We had met prior to COVID, fished together a little bit, and then through COVID and coming out of COVID, we had spent a lot of time together. Um, it's always fun when they come up into our neck of the woods and we get a chance to jump in the boat together. And we've had some amazing experiences in the boat. We've had big fish caught. We've lost some big fish. We've had broken rods. We've had multi-fish days. We've fished new water. We've had some laughs. They'd, they've stayed at our family cabin and we've got to spend a lot of time with them away from fishing. And it's those kind of connections that musky fishing has brought me that I'm super happy with because when musky fishing is something in the past for me, I'll still have those friendships. So being able to get them out on new to them water, something we've been trying to do now for a couple of years was really important and really special for me. We only had a few hours to get together, but we did make the best of it. I had to work, but later in the day, but we, we found a little opportunity to get out and as always we had a lot of laughs we managed to put one in the boat and there's a really cool sequence where we moved three fish caught one and i wish we would have had more time on the water but in spite of our time limitations we did move some fish we've you know seen a few things so i just i wanted to share and i think this was a really interesting catch in the fact that matt makes a comment that never really occurred to me after the fact and i want to talk about that in today's breakdown let's go check out this catch we uh, caught two back-to-back -back trolling and then dumped a really big one just after All right, guys, it's the return of the Abels for good, bad, or otherwise. I finally got them out on one of our favorite lakes. We've tried this a couple times and it hasn't really worked out. We're on our first spot and Matt's got one. Watch it come up and hit him. It's not real big, but it's his first one on this lake. Let's have a little look at it. First spot. Nice little musky. Thanks, Glenn. Got this one on a red October 10 inch tube. Nice All day. right, it's we'll get that one. one back. And we'll have a quick look at that tube. 
Oh yeah, he's gonna splash you on the way out. Nice. All right, we'll let Matt get this tube out. Nothing real particularly special about this tube. No mods really on it. But the 10 inch monster is just like a staple kind of bait. Yep, just tangled in the net. The fish was really... Yeah, he kind of thrashed around. around. All right, we'll let Matt get that out. We'll get set up and keep working this point. Always a good spot. We got kind of a south wind pushing on here after a couple days of west and northwest wind. Hopefully there's a little bit of warmer water here and we'll see a few more, but we only got about three and a half, four hours today. So we're gonna try and make the best of it. So we'll be right back. Welcome back to another Little Tykes Breakdown. And today's breakdown is brought to you by my buddy Dirk from Belgium. And I'm not even gonna try and pronounce his last name properly. We've talked away from YouTube. We actually helped set him up with some Red October tubes. So thanks to Mark and Hans for that, getting a package out to him last year. And he's been a huge supporter of the channel. So I just wanna show a little bit of love back. So this breakdown today is brought to you by Dirk from Belgium. Today's breakdown, no surprise, we're talking about fishing deep water. That's a lot of what we do. But it was really interesting after the fact what Matt had said. and We don't really think of it that way. So let me try to explain. So we're just fishing a main lake point and it's, it's deep water all around 30 to 35, 40 feet deep. And it has a small little shelf along the edge that you can see ranges from 10, 12, eight. There's actually a couple submerged rocks on one little spot. We're not trying to target those. I'm kind of explaining to Matt that that's not what we're casting at. And as we are working up this shoreline, I'm keeping the boat in 30 to 35 feet of water. And we're just gonna work right around that point. And the interesting thing here is that we have natural lake current that pushes from the southeast and pushes around this way. So you can think of it as that current is going to hit here and kind of roll down that ledge. And yes, it's not very much current, but there is natural lake current that has to flow there. And a spot like this, when you drive by it on shield lakes, does not look like a musky spot. But when you find these kind of spots that have lake current, that have a little bit of wind pushing around them, and you have just that small little shelf that can hold muskies. And as we were working up here, Ron had cast up and he had pulled a fish off that he moved in the eight. And then in the other clip, you'll see that Matt casts right up to about that 12 foot ledge. And I was like, oh, somebody had a really late lazy follow. And then a few casts later, Matt casts out again around that 12 foot break line and Cindy and I are holding a conversation and as you can see Matt's rod load up I was like oh yeah you got him because I seen the fish come straight off the bottom and hit him and we are not pinpoint sharpshooting these fish I'm just using the live scope to keep myself off that ledge and I'm going to show you another way to look at this that maybe will be a little bit easier to kind of explain what it is we're targeting. So if I flip this over into more of like a 2D view, we can kind of see where that 10 to foot, 10 to 12 foot deep shelf is. And then it's pretty steep drop right to the bottom. And what I see a lot, and in the video right here, we talk about how a lot of people come to Shield Lakes and they want to do this. They want to cast right up there and they only want to target that little shelf and then they just, they get their bait in. And for us, that's not really how we target it. A lot of times we'll see fish sitting pretty close to that transition line or we see fish sitting out over it or down deep, but very much in line with those transition lines to the top. We talk about those vertical lines a lot. And in this case, what we're trying to target is that ledge. Matt casts in, 
about to the corner of that ledge, pops his tube a bit, and I actually see the fish come straight up and hit him. And that's where, for us, we don't think much of that catch. We see a lot of fish come from 15, 25, 30 feet up and hit baits, and we don't think a lot of it. And after the fact, Matt had said to me, he's like, there's no way that fish could have came up from 30 feet. It would have suffer, suffered from barotrauma. And I, I had never thought, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd never thought of it that way. And that's what I put on the board here. This isn't Minnesota because Matt said in Minnesota, first off, they would not target fish that were sitting down in 30 feet. And I didn't actually see the fish on the scope. I didn't see it until it started moving and coming up. So it's not like we we're targeting it, but for us up here, we don't even question it. Those fish will come up, they'll hit a bait, and they go right back down. And for all intents and purposes, we're comfortable with that. The surface temps are not super warm. So that opened up a little bit of a discussion in the boat after we had turned the cameras off. So Matt had said that in Minnesota, guys wouldn't even target those fish, and if they did, in all likelihood that fish would have died or suffered from barrow trauma. And it's a subject that I honestly don't know a whole bunch about. I do plan on talking to a biologist that works with Muskies Canada in the next coming weeks. And we're gonna talk about subjects like that. And I wanna talk about spawning and warm water and how that affects both the spawning and the fish in the summer. <clears throat> Excuse me. He wants to stay clear of forward facing sonar, but these are subjects that kind of lead themselves kind of towards that, but that's not really what we're talking about in it. But the fact is that there's been some debate on whether the muskies actually suffer from barrow trauma. And I just recently listened to a podcast from Tyler Andrews, the muskie guru on Not Another Muskie podcast, or Not a Muskie podcast, I believe it's called. I'll put the link down below. And he has a scientist on there, and he talks a lot about the physiology of a muskie and how they may not suffer from barrow trauma in the sense of, say, a walleye. From our perspective, we've caught a lot of fish in that 20 to 30 even deeper as as we start to get into turnover and those fish they go back fine they don't look overly stressed as Just long as we as the hard. angler let's get them back don't let's get stress some more. them more than than necessary so it it's an interesting topic and it's one that you hear a lot about the minnesota guys talking about well you can't catch those fish down deep and that's kind of the the crux of the forward facing sonar is that people are targeting these fish down deep and those fish are instantly dying when you release them be due to barrow trauma or shock or, you know, a combination of stress, shock and, and barrow trauma. Now, again, I don't, I don't know the science behind it. I can just give you our experiences on the water. And in today's catch, that fish Get kicked that it was strong it went right back down it hung out about 25 feet Sorry, down i could out. see it on the scope nice. for <clears throat> excuse me a few minutes i i wouldn't have suspected there was any lasting damage to that fish it made me question you know what is the difference between people that routinely troll and I just talked to Jeff Weedman off air when we did a podcast a while back about this subject. And there's a couple really good anglers from the eastern U.S. that come up here to Cedar Lake. And they do really well. But they do a lot of trolling in the summer. And a lot of those fish are coming from 25, 30 feet deep. And to me, that's exact same as using a tube or a, a pit bull or whatever rubber bait you're using and pulling those fish out of 30 feet but yet the community seems to view casting and pulling a fish out of deep water as detrimental yet a lot of these trollers come up here and routinely catch fish down in that deeper water and it's just it's an interesting subject that's one i want to try and explore a little bit more this off season and talk to a few 
guys that are predominantly trollers and talk to a few guys that are, you know, the predominantly casters in some of that deeper water situation. And I know there's a couple guys on Eagle Lake that we kind of have learned from or got information from that helped us learn to fish deeper. So I'd like to reach out to them too, because the way the community talks negatively about catching fish from deep water, I don't think it matters if you use a scope or you don't use a scope. If you're catching a fish out of 25 or 30 foot deep, I, I just, I got to think that the effects are the same, whether you have a, a live scope on your boat or not. So I, I do think it's a really cool subject and one that I definitely want to talk about a little bit more throughout the off season. One last thing before we kind of wrap this one up and I appreciate you guys kind of, you know, staying with us here. It's, it's kind of a, a touchy subject when you talk about, you know, catching fish from deep water versus not, but you heard me on the video say, well, Matt, it's just like a, a regular tube, nothing fancy, not necessarily true. And I, we didn't catch another fish. So I didn't get to circle back around to his tube, but this is a standard 10 inch monster tube set up right from the factory so the back hook on that wire is about the distance of the tails on the tube and for comparison's sake here's a seven inch ninja tube from the factory same thing the hook is about the end of the tails so what matt did on his tube is he shortened this up so that the hook sits just behind the body so again, for comparison's sake, here's a seven inch Ninja tube that we had modified. So the hook sits a little bit tighter to the body. That way, if they head hunt it or they grab it there, you got a better chance of getting that back hook into the fish versus it being, you know, way at the back end of the body. Then you got to move a lot more bait to get that back hook if they happen to miss the front ones. And the other mod that he had, and we talk about it on one of our videos, is had the little bell, the little ice fishing bell in there. These ones don't have it because they're pretty much stock, uh, save for this one I shortened up. So he did have a few mods on there. It That little bell, it's questionable how much it does make, but we found that it does help. And having that hook a little bit tighter to the body just helps you get a hook set if they happen to hit like right there and that front hooks away from them. You don't have to pull the lure through their mouth quite as much to get hooked up. So guys, check out the video here where we talk about all the mods to tubes and how cool tubes sound underwater. One of our favorite baits. Catch a ton of fish every year on them. For now, 54 buses out of here. We'll catch you guys out on the water later.